If you guys will, please do me a favor, stand up, find somebody that you don't know, and greet them for about 30 or 40 seconds. We are a cross aisle church, so don't be confined by your space. Find somebody that you don't know and find out their name. If you're online joining us from the state or from the county, please type in your name, talk with a host, and get to know everybody who's working online with you there. Man, oh man. Have you guys ever taken a moment to wonder just what it is that has gotten you this far in your life? What is your driving motivation? What is the foundation of your life that has pushed you to do the things you do and say the things you say and to be around the people that you're around on a day-to-day basis? What is it that when you get out of bed and you put on your pants and you get ready for work or you get ready to take the kids somewhere or maybe you get ready to go see your friends, what is it that frames and guides your life? You see, each and every one of us in here has a foundation. And these foundation are things that lead us and guide us and push us forward. On days where we don't feel like moving forward, they are the things that we look for. Generally, the foundations are made up of three things. People, things, and ideals. And if it's people that drive me, maybe it's my family, then what will happen is my internal dialogue will look a lot like, man, I hope and I can't wait to get home to see my family. I can't wait to spend time with them. I can't wait to go on vacation with them. But if it's things or wealth, then a lot of our internal dialogue will look focused in that area. We can't wait to get that next raise. We can't wait to get that next car. We can't wait to get to that next house. And generally, both of those avenues are shaped by ideals, either that we have crafted and created consciously or subconsciously, or that we fell into in life, things that our parents or our grandparents or mentors have fed into us, and they generally guide and shape the pursuits and the pathways that we take because of our foundation. And so we find ourselves thinking like, man, if only, if only I had that house, then I would be happy because my foundation determines my happiness, right? If only, if only I had that job, then, then I, would, I would be happy. If only I had hair like Marshall, then I, I would be happy. If only I had married that person, then, then I would be happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't keep a straight face through that one. Maybe it says, if only I hadn't married that person, then I'd be happy. But we think things about our happiness and our priorities because of our foundation. And that foundation is what we stand on when we walk in life. When we move, when we talk, when we witness, when we say different things to different people, all of that stems from our foundation. As Americans, we have the right to do what we're passionate about. That's a privilege that we have. We can seek what we are passionate about. The freedom or the right to pursue happiness, we may not find it, it doesn't give us the right to find happiness, but it gives us the right to pursue happiness. It's a wonderful blessing, but it can also be a double-edged sword because the right to pursue happiness is only healthy when my idea of happiness is submerged in healthiness. When what I want to be happy also makes me healthy, then it's a good thing. But what we see often in culture right now is happiness and healthiness have been dominated and separated by this thing called feelings. It would be safe to say or sum up the idea that floats around is, as I feel, 
so I am. Or as I feel, so I do. And the problem that comes from that is not to take emotions or emotional health and lower them because they are very, very important. But the problem is, is when my reality is overtaken by my emotions, there's a balance and a tipping point where it becomes very unhealthy. I'm going to be honest with you guys. There are some days that I don't feel like adulting. Have y'all ever felt that way? Amen, hallelujah, praise Jesus. I want to find me a sushi joint and stay there for weeks. Right? Like, it's just, I don't want to adult. I don't want to pay bills. I don't want to deal with dissension. I don't want to deal with trouble. I don't want to go and cause problems for my wife because I know I'm going to. I just want to, to be a kid. And when I was a kid, I just wanted to be an adult. I couldn't wait to get adult money. I didn't realize how many adult bills came with it. But that's what I wanted. We, we sometimes want things. It's like chasing a tiger. Well, what are you going to do when you catch it? I don't know. But I'm having fun chasing it. Sometimes we need to slow down and ask ourselves, what is my foundation? What is my foundation? Is my foundation a a job? Is it a a bank account? Is it a people group? Is it a, a person? Is it my spouse? My children? My grandchildren? What is my foundation? And this becomes an incredibly important question And young people in here, if you are just getting out of high school or you're just getting into college or you're just leaving or maybe you're just getting married or you're just getting ready to have your first kid, I want to encourage you today so, so much as a word of advice, focus on your foundation before you focus on your fortune. Focus on your foundation before you focus on your fortune. And what I mean by that is this. Focus on who you are and what your life is based upon before you focus on getting what you want. Because when life comes and storms hit and you get punched in the face by the circumstances around you, your foundation will be tested. And if you have not focused it, And if you have not placed it in the right place on the right person, then it will crumble and you will fall. So I ask again, what is your foundation? This morning, I'm really excited to start a new series uh, called Fun in the Psalms. And if you hadn't guessed, it's a highly scientific thing, but it's based out of the book of Psalms, right? And so in this Psalms, we get to go through and see uh, several different weeks of our favorite Psalms, and it was a pastor's choice, so I got to choose. And today, we're starting off with Psalms number one. If you've never read through the book of Psalms before, it's broken up into five different parts, uh, two or three of which are written by King David, and then there are some other authors that intersperse throughout there, but each of them are framed by this saying. They're framed by the idea that, that we say, praise be to the Lord, and amen, amen. Praise be to the Lord starts Every section, and amen, amen, ends every one. These songs are sometimes proclamations of wisdom. Sometimes they're hymns asking for the death of their enemies. A lot of us probably really like those. And sometimes they're laments against the death and the struggles and the pain that is going on in and around these people's life. But all of them come from a very deep and very personal place of involvement. The authors wrote these psalms and hymns and songs not as something to be come to frivolously, not as something to be looked at, read, and then put down, but as something to guide generations of their people. 
During the intertestimonial period, that's the time in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, which is about 400 years, the Psalms were instrumental in guiding God's people towards wisdom, worship, and ultimately salvation. The greatest rulers, prophets, and sages of an entire people collected their thoughts from years of experience in the the good times and the bad, and they placed it on paper to guide generations of people. These words, this book, can have great value for us when we come to it with an earnest mindset. And here's why I I bring this up. Sometimes we come to worship and on a more general basis, our relationship with God with a unintentional or maybe even frivolous setting. We, We relegate it to Sunday morning, to a time and a place of my choosing, with my comfort, with songs that I like, with people that I chose, and at a time and relevancy that really fits my personality. When in reality, our worship is not about us. Our relationship with God is less about us and more about him. See, when we come here, either in person or online, we come here to set Jesus Christ As center stage, we put our worries aside and put his grace in the middle. We take our wants and needs and put them over so that his righteousness and power can take over, not the other way around. And so what I want to challenge all of us here today, as we get ready to come into the presence of God through this whole month, through worship, through Sundays, through small groups, through the sermons, through everything we do in our personal devotions, is to intentionally come before God, asking the question, God, what is my foundation? And what would you have me do? So, With that said, let's jump in and read our primary passage for this morning. It's Psalm 1, starting off in verse 1. And I love this passage because it's super simple and super applicable. It says this, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. How many of you guys have ever found yourself in the company of mockers? Some of y'all that didn't raise your hand are the mockers, but that's okay. We still love you, right? It goes on in verse 2. It says, but those who delight in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteousness. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Let's pick apart this a little bit. Look at verse 1. It says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Here's the truth. What goes on around you eventually might happen inside you. What goes on around you eventually might happen inside you. The meaning behind this idea or this word to sit in the company of mockers means to settle in and make yourself comfortable. It's not talking about I'm just walking around. What it's talking about is that I went and I intentionally moved and I intentionally found someone who was a sinner or a mocker and I sat next to them and I got real comfortable. How you doing, Marshall? Now I'm real comfortable. Marshall is probably super uncomfortable right now. But it's different, right? And there's a big, big thing we have to do. We have to understand that what he's talking about here is not witnessing to others. 
The psalmist, King David, who's, who's writing this, is not telling us not to hang out with sinners because none of us would hang out with anybody. We are all sinners and have all fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? That's very important. What he's talking about is an intentional mindset where I'm not just hanging out with other people, but I'm going to those places and becoming like them instead of making them become like Christ. Uh, Steve Hetzick, a uh, pastor that I listened to this week, said, Christians who change the world are ones who don't let the world change them. You see, God calls us to witness. Our purpose, laterally, is to literally preach, teach, and save, to expand the gospel and the kingdom of God. My job is to go out and tell other people about Jesus Christ. That is my job. And those people are not always going to be living lives that are clean and fancy and, and have no mess. Those people, us, right, our people, our lives, sometimes they're going to have a little bit of dirt. Sometimes it's going to be a little bit awkward. Sometimes it's going to have some trouble and some things that happen that we have to work through. But it's very important to make sure that we go to them to change them to look like Christ, not get so comfortable that we look like the world. The meaning behind this is to be careful with what influences us. Be careful with what I allow in here. Look at this next part. In verse 2 it says, But those who delight is the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Now, the, the term here for meditate, a lot of us when we think of meditation, we think of like sitting there with our fingers crossed, you know, the old man who's bald floating in the air, looks a lot like Pete right here. He's going, hmm, right? I love you, Pete. This word does not mean that. The root word is hegah. And hegah means literally, look at this, a low moaning, to coo, to mutter, to moan, or to talk to one's self about. The, the root ideal or imagery of this word is the low moaning of an animal while it chews on its cud, that, that idea that it's content. Mm, and it's so good. Oh, he's thinking about sushi. Yeah. And he meditates. He mulls over the law of the Lord. The one who doesn't just pick it up and then set it down and forget what it said. But the one who lets it ruminate in his life. The mom who, who dwells on it day and night. The dad who, who seeks earnestly on ways to put it into their life. The son who says, how can I follow after God in ways that matter? That is what it means to ruminate on the laws of the Lord. Look at this in the next verse. We look at this. This person is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, and whatever they do prospers. All of us have seen trees that are healthy. All of us have also seen trees who are dying and in need of nourishment. And what this verse is saying to us is that the person who comes to God and who ruminates on his law, who does not walk in the way of the wicked or sit in the company of mockers is like a tree that is planted next to a stream. In other words, it has all the nourishment that it ever could or ever would need to grow and to prosper in its life. And so if we're here today, and the tree of our life is withering. And the, the health of our leaves are browning. And the things that we have and we say and we do are not 
pleasing. We're not the person that we want to be. We're not in the place that we wanted to be at this point in our life. We're not as mature as we thought we would be. We don't have as many blessings as we thought we would have. I'm not in the place with God that I I wanted to be. The cure for that is planting ourselves next to a stream. But here's the thing, and this is important. That's your choice. It's your choice where you plant your roots. Your foundation is your choice. If my foundation is people, that is my choice. If my foundation is money, that is my choice. If my foundation is God, that is my choice. Nobody can make that for me. I cannot make that choice for you guys, and God refuses you to. God refuses to make the choice for you. Here's the thing. God shows us the way. He gives us the path. He offers us salvation, but he lets us choose. He lets us choose what our foundation is, where we go and what we do. And when we look at the psalm and we say, well, well, wow, that's, that's what I want. I want to be a tree planted next to water and I, I want to have health and I want to have blessings and I want to have all these things overflowing and I don't want to stand with the wicked or walk in the way of sinners or sit next to mockers. God, I want these people and these things and distractions out of my life. We have to understand that it is a choice on our part to make changes. One definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, yet expecting the same results. People say, I want a different life, but they don't want different habits. People say, I want more money, but they're not willing to work harder. People say, I want to get out of sin, but they're not willing to get into church. People say, Josh, I want to change my life, but they have to be able to want to make those changes. Well, here's the good news. The choice is absolutely yours. But making it isn't easy. See, I can decide to choose, but actually choosing on a day-to-day basis gets tough. Because when the pressure goes up, when things get hard, when adulting becomes uncomfortable, It's easy to fall back on old habits. The only one who can do that, though, is you. Look at what it says in verse 4. Not so the wicked. They are like the chaff that the wind blows away, and therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteousness. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So as our band comes up to play our final song, I want to ask you this question one last time. What is your foundation? What is it that drives you? Is it something inside you? A need for an external thing or validation from a purpose? Or is it your foundation in Christ? Not just what do I want it to be, but what is brutally honest, looking at our lives right now, what is my foundation? The second question is this, what do I want that foundation to be? Am I pleased with what that foundation is? Is that foundation strong and secure? Is it bringing me into the presence of God on a daily basis? Am I happy with it? Or is it lacking? Am I the tree that's next to the water or I'm the person walking in the ways of the wicked? Who's being blown away like chaff? And the third question, and this is perhaps the most important. 
what are we going to do about it? Because this week, as I was asking myself these questions, if I'm honest, I wasn't completely pleased with my answers. But God doesn't expect perfection. He expects devotion. And so, church, whether you're here in this room or whether you're watching online, my question to you is what are we going to do about it? Are we going to continue to be the same? Are we going to continue to walk like we are? Or are we going to seek and strive and pray and struggle for something better? Are we going to look at our lives and recognize that this is a foundation that God wants to build. And in order to do that, we need to step out and do. Faith is the first step. But it is not the only one. Look at this, what it says in James chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily foods, and as one of you says, go in peace, keep warm and, and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? I don't know about you guys, but I've been in the position before where I've been hurting and I've been tired and I've been hungry and I've had people walk up to me and say, I'm praying for you, brother. And I'm like, that's great. What about a burger? Hey, man, you know, my power is getting ready to be turned off. What about a power bill? Hey, my yard needs to be mowed. What about a, a mower? Hey, there's needs in my life. And while prayer is great, the answer to prayer is probably sitting in this room. We say, God, move. And God says, I sent you. We say, God, do something. And God says, I know. What are you going to do? James here is saying, faith is important, but because of that faith, though our deeds do not save us, they are evidence of our salvation. They are absolutely evidence of our salvation. In verse 17, it says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. What good is it if we tell the world about Jesus, but we don't show them who he is? What good is it if we tell the world how much we're a family, but we don't show them how true that is? What good is it are words if they are hollow and not backed up by action? Look what James ends with here. But someone will say in verse 18, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my, my faith by my deeds. Christians, and, and in fact, let me broaden this even further. People, by and large, are great at pointing out problems. We love as people, as Americans, as humans, as a whole world to look at a problem and point out a solution and say, this is what we need to do, that's what's wrong, here's how we're gonna fix it. But we're not really good with following through. Because that's hard work, right? It's easy to look at a problem, it's hard to get involved in fixing the problem. And one of the things that we refuse to do at the Union Cross campus is to look at an issue without presenting a way to fix the issue. This is something that when I first came on staff here absolutely helped me fall in love with this campus because we were a pro-life church, but we actually did things to help pro-life movements. We actually went and we were involved in adoption and we were involved in, in, in childcare and we were involved in educating women and we got supporting the pregnancy network and all these things. It wasn't just something we espoused. It was something we tried to help become a part of the solution. And as a church family, we refuse to be anything else. We refuse to be people who just look at a problem and point a finger. 
We want to be part of the people that run towards the problem saying, let me help. Let me help. Maybe that looks like singing on stage. Maybe that looks like giving somebody a hug. Maybe that looks like pulling out your mower. Maybe it looks like sending somebody a letter or having coffee when somebody's down. But we don't want to just look at the problems of the world and say, oh, look at all those sinners. Because, man, they can look right back and say the exact same thing. And so today, as we ask what our foundation is, I want to challenge us to make our foundation a God that moves. Jesus Christ was a God of action. He went from place to place, preaching and teaching and saving and healing. He was constantly on the move, and he has called us to be the exact same way. And if you're here today and you're wondering, how in the world can I get involved in that? This is our challenge for this week. This is our challenge for how we want to go out and apply this in our lives. Every quarter here at the Union Cross Campus, we do something called a game plan. And the game plan consists of four different things that we want to, as an entire church body, focus on. There are more than 600 people that are active on a monthly basis at this campus. 600 people that come in and out these doors every single month. Imagine if 600 people got on mission and got on point following after God and changing their community. That is enough hands and feet to change the face of Kernersville. And so today I want to both challenge and invite you to come along with us on this mission. For the next three months, Our theme is generosity. And we have four different areas, numerical, spiritual, financial, and missional. And if you want to see more about them, there's a graphic, and I believe it was just on the screen. It'll be back up in a second. But you can take a picture of that QR code, and it'll take you to our online hub. And it'll tell you different ways that you can get involved in these four different areas. But look, a game plan is only good if people follow it. A game plan's only good if people actually follow it. And so what are you going to do this week? Are we going to go about life in the, the same way as we always do? Or are we going to step out and get on the field? Are we going to take part in the kingdom of God's growth? Are we going to spread the word to others? Are we going to invite people to come be a part of this? Are we going to take part in the study on generosity that will start later this week? Are we going to give in the financial giving challenge for this summer? I got an update on that, by the way. Our our average giving for this year is just a little bit below 7,000. And last week, in the middle of supposedly one of the deadest months of the year for giving, our average was over $2,000 above that. Last week, in the, in the beginning of summer, our, our giving was $9,000.50. That's wonderful. But I can't do that on my own. Marshall can. He's probably rich, but... The staff can't do that on our own. None of us as individuals can do that on our own. It takes a family to overcome these obstacles. Look at this. There were 43 giving units last week. That is the highest in the history of our church. 43 giving units. That includes individuals and families who decided to step out and say, in this time, that's tough. Gas is $54 an ounce. A loaf of bread cost me a kidney. Like, everything's expensive. I went out the other day to the movies with Heidi and Izzy and came back with no retirement fund. Like, it's expensive. I get it. But people who said, I want to step out on faith and give, not because Josh asked for it, but because we're bought into the why of the kingdom of God, to seek 
and to save other people, to spread the gospel. And we do that with our time, our treasures, and our talents. And so I want to invite you guys. If you want a paper version of that, it's going to be outside. There's going to be some lovely young ladies and men handing out the game plan this week. But I would like to challenge every single person, both in person and online, to get involved in our game plan. And so now, if you will, please stand and sing with us our song of invitation.